This is KGW News at Noon. And we start off today with the hot weather. Parts of the Willamette Valley will see highs in the 90s today, and the Portland area could break a record. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brenda Braxton. It's expected to be the hottest day so far this year in the Rose City. Let's check in with meteorologist Chris McGinnis this afternoon. So, Chris, what is the current temperature? Well, we're already 81 degrees outside the studios. It's toasty out here on the roof. I can tell you that, Brendan, as we check out the current numbers across the region. There you go. We are in the 80s in a lot of locations already across the immediate metro area. See some low to mid 80s. Let's shift down south into the Willamette Valley. I think we can bring up uh, the Salem current temperatures and you can see a lot of lower to middle 80s already on the map here at the lunchtime hour. So with that in mind, the Weather Service issuing a heat advisory in effect for everywhere that you see shaded in yellow. And that's because uh, not only the temperature is going to be pretty hot today, but they're going to be hot again tomorrow. So we're looking at back to back days of mid 90s, we think here in the Willamette Valley. And not only that, the overnights are going to be fairly mild as well. So another reason why that heat, advi heat advisory is uh, continuous through tomorrow evening. Let's go ahead and get a look at the day planner again. Wall to wall sunshine. It's beautiful out here for sure bright sun definitely need to uh, prepare for that I didn't bring my shades up here I needed them and you'll note on that day planner graphic the sunset 859 tonight is the last night that the sun sets at 859 starting tomorrow we're into the nine o'clock hour wow. summer <laughs> is almost here and it certainly feels like it Brenda it certainly does thank you Chris mm -hmm. Hey, if you ride Max or West, the heat can slow down your commute, but TriMet is working to keep those trains running at full speed. KGW's Tim Gordon is live now in the newsroom. So, Tim, some trains handle the heat better than others, right? Yeah, that's right, Brenda. TriMet has made improvements to the red and blue lines before last summer to handle heat up to 100 degrees. They can go full speed. All the other trains have to slow down some once it hits 90 degrees, and that would be later today. The delays are up to 15 minutes on the orange, yellow, and green lines when the temp is between 90 and 100 degrees. Delays climb to a half an hour or more for all MAX trains when it gets above 100. The reason, metal expands when it gets hot. Steel rails can expand by several inches in super hot weather. And copper overhead lines that power the trains expand too and sag. TriMet improved a counterweight system on the red and blue lines so the lines don't sag as much. That means they'll be able to handle heat better. So that they could still keep that tension in that line so that we could run trains at speed. And we also put in some anchor ties in key sections of the rail to keep that rail from expanding and, and creating what's called a sun kink. The West Commute train can handle the heat better now too, thanks to improvements to the rails it runs on and the installation of a positive train control system. That's getting a little technical. All commuters care about is getting where they want to go efficiently, hopefully without breaking a big sweat waiting for a train. Uh, going, it's annoying as hell, dude. Um, try to find the nearest See, people have like little fans and stuff like that, so I try to like sit next to an old lady who's a fan. <laughs> try to get that breeze yeah. as much as possible. Yeah, different strategies for different folks. So what about the buses? Well, TriMet finds that they can get slowed down too uh, because of other traffic out there. Apparently drivers get bogged down some too in the heat. So patience, folks. Brenda? That last guy was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. All right, Tim, thank you. Well, as the weather heats up, lots of swimmers and boaters will be out on the water, so safety is front and center for first responders. Yesterday, law enforcement and fire agencies from all across the state were out on the Rogue River in southern Oregon for training. Crews were learning different techniques to keep themselves out of harm's way while saving lives. It's our job to teach them survival techniques, whitewater rescue techniques, and then for the next four days we go into drift boats. Some of us are marine deputies and we're out there in the water. People are in need of help and we need to, we need to know this stuff. Crews have been doing this training on the Rogue River for more than a decade now. A lot of businesses in the area welcome people who need a cool place to stay. Here are just a few of them. The Canby Adult Center is open until 4.30 this afternoon. You can also go to the Estacada Public Library. It's open till 7. And if you're in Tualatin, the public library there is also open. It closes at 9 p.m. We have a full list of cooling centers on our website, kgw.com. You can always stay up to date with the forecast anytime by going to the KGW weather app. 
A 13 year old with cancer and her mother have skipped town and the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office is looking for them. The state says Kylie needs traditional medical care. Christine Pitawanich is covering this story for us and Christine, I'm telling you, it is heartbreaking no matter how you look at it. Brenda, it really is. The whole thing is a little complicated, but basically the mom is doing what she feels is best for her child. Then you've got the doctors who believe their treatment is the right way to go. So stuck in the middle is a kid struggling with cancer who just wants to feel better. Hi, my name is Kylie and I've written down a few things. This YouTube video is from a couple months ago. The words of a 13-year-old suffering from a rare form of cancer are heartbreakingly raw. And all I want is to go back to school to feel like a normal kid as much as I can. I don't want to have to wonder if I'm going to live or die every day of my life anymore. But that stress no 13-year-old should have to go through may be amplified. She and her mom, Christina Dixon, took off, and now deputies with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office are looking for them. Um, Christina never told me that, that she was planning on doing this. Erin Purchase knows the family. Uh, Kylie was inpatient for six months, and the chemotherapy did not help her. She did not see tumor regression. She was very sick. I couldn't even walk, talk, or breathe on my own. That's when Purchase says Christina turned to alternatives, giving her daughter medicinal cannabis and connecting with a naturopathic physician. She says Kylie's tumor shrank. Instantly, she just started getting better. But then problems arose when doctors wanted to take out what was left of the tumor and suggested traditional medical care. This is a very risky surgery. Purchase says Christina got conflicting information from another doctor and couldn't get a clear answer about the odds of Kylie surviving the surgery. Now deputies are looking for mother and daughter, saying Christina is ignoring a court order to bring Kylie to the Department of Human Services. So they're forcing treatment on her, so they're not letting her, they're not letting her have a chance to get second opinions and talk to other doctors. Listen to Kylie's video and it's clear what she wants. Nobody else will help my mom. I've watched her stay up night after night. I'll wake up and she's still up late at night calling, asking for help with no resources. Everybody keeps turning their back and all I'm asking is for somebody to help my mom. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Uh, cannot help but feel for everyone involved. Meantime, investigators believe Christina Dixon and her daughter Kylie are in either Oregon or Washington. They should be driving a 2012 white smart car with blue trim with Oregon license plate on your screen 308 FRH. The Clackamas County Sheriff's Office wants you to give them a call if you know anything. Back to you. Oh, Christine, that is so hard to listen to. Her well-being is the most important thing. I hope they work it out. Yeah. Thank you. An Alaska Airlines plane flying from San Francisco to Seattle had to make an emergency landing at PDX late last night. Somebody inside the plane took this cell phone video and you can see firefighters walking through the cabin. We talked to a man on board that flight who noticed a strong smell like burning it was like burning electrical it was almost like burning my eyes and my nose at one point it was it was pretty strong alaska says there's no indication there was a fire on board a technician is inspecting the plane to pinpoint the cause of the smell lawmakers in new york want to ban certain helicopters from flying over manhattan the push comes one day after a chopper slammed into a skyscraper killing the pilot Here's NBC's Kathy Park with the latest. Investigators are pouring over the roof of this 54-story skyscraper in the heart of New York City, hunting for clues into what may have caused Monday's deadly helicopter crash. We have what appears to be a helicopter that crashed into the roof. The helicopter is on fire. The chopper pilot, Timothy McCormack, who was flying alone, was killed. A senior law enforcement official telling NBC News that they believe this video shows the chopper flying erratically moments before impact, but that information still needs to be confirmed by the FAA.
These images show pieces of the aircraft scattered over the roof. The impact was so intense, it started a fire. Employees felt the building shake. Not like an earthquake, it was just like it was going to fall. Confusion leading to moments of chaos. You get in the lobby and you have people screaming at you, get outside, get outside. Now it's scary. Workers began pouring outside into the rain, just blocks from Times Square and Trump Tower. There is no indication at this time that this was an act of terror and there is no ongoing threat to New York City. But many New Yorkers held their breath as initial reports triggered memories of the September 11th attacks. As soon as you hear an aircraft hit a building, uh, I think my mind goes where every New Yorker's mind goes. Officials say the helicopter took off from the 34th Street helipad on Manhattan's east side after dropping off a passenger. The deadly crash occurring just 11 minutes later. This morning, it's still unclear why the pilot was flying under such poor visibility in a flight zone that's been restricted ever since President Trump took office. To go into that area, a helicopter would need the approval of LaGuardia Tower, and we need to find out if that happened or not here. That was Kathy Park reporting. The pilot's brother spoke with NBC News, saying his sibling had years of experience in the air, including time as a flight instructor. Thousands of birds are making their home on the Astoria Megler Bridge, and their droppings are creating a big old mess. These are double-crested cormorants. State wildlife officials have counted at least 8,000 birds and 3,000 nests. They're federally protected, so they can't be killed. The problem is they eat endangered salmon and their droppings are corrosive. Cormorant guano is really acidic and it's, it's just, it's really hard on the paint job of the bridge. And my understanding is the paint job alone for the bridge costs millions of dollars. And ODOT says if the birds continue living here, they may have to paint the bridge more often. Right now, it only gets a fresh coat every 20 years. ODFW says the cormorants used to live on East Sand Island, about seven miles away, but a wildlife management plan there likely pushed them out and onto the bridge. Because the birds are federally protected, options to get rid of them are mostly limited to scare tactics like water cannons, falconry, and fireworks.